السلام عليكم. This is Dr. Marima Abdullah, a professor in orthodontics and a senior orthodontic consultant. And this lecture is the second part covering local factors as an etiology of malocclusion. Same references, chapter five from Prophet, chapter three from Laura Mitchell, already uploaded onto your e-learning website. And we're going to finish up with the variation in tooth number. I think we've reached to the last one that is retained deciduous teeth. <coughs> so, why do we usually have retained deciduous teeth? Well, this could be part of delayed eruption of uh, permanent teeth. Uh, it could be uh, iatrogenic. Um, we call a deciduous tooth a retained tooth when it is beyond the um, dental age that it's supposed to be present with. And if we have the contralateral permanent tooth erupting but the, uh, uh, and the affected side is not erupted yet, we actually wait for six months. If the deciduous tooth does not uh, get loose and lost, uh, then we call this the deciduous tooth, a retained tooth. Uh, we usually look at patients' dental age. We don't look at patients' chronological age because, for example, this patient here, we talked about in our last lecture, uh, chronological age is 13 years old. Dental age, if we look at the, uh, the dental age, well, he's almost 9 to 10 in terms of dental development. So here we have delayed dental uh, development and we have multiple retained uh, deciduous teeth. For example, here we have the B and the B, and this is mainly due to, for example, in this case, congenital missing lateral incisors. So if we are in doubt, if, um, if we assess patient's dental age and we think that the deciduous tooth is retained, then we need to take radiographs to confirm presence of, the, of permanent successor and the etiology of having this tooth uh, retained for this long time. So um, one of the etiological reasons, as we said, is uh, permanent successor being absent, hypodontia, or maybe the uh, permanent successor is misplaced, like for this patient here. This young lady had uh, an E uh, that has retained for a long time, the patient is about uh, 12 to 13 years of age, and all teeth are present uh, uh, six to six uh, uh, closely, except for the upper second premolars, uh, where we have retained teeth. And one of the etiological factors, as you could see here, the permanent second premolar deflected from its normal path of eruption, and we don't have the appropriate process of root resorption, so it, this ended up with retained deciduous teeth. <coughs> uh, another reason just to, to look at is sometimes infection and ankylosis can cause a deciduous tooth to stay longer than it is supposed or, or it's expected. Uh, so what happens if a deciduous tooth was retained? What are the consequences? Well, first of all, like here, we can have ectopic eruption of permanent teeth. So the deciduous canines retained, permanent canines were erupting buccally, displaced buccally. So that's one of the consequences. Another one is the impaction. So if we look at this patient here, we will find that we have uh, retained deciduous teeth and the permanent teeth hasn't erupted yet. And if we take a radiograph, we will find that the, the canines are actually impacted, severely impacted, and during treatment, they actually erupted palatally. So one of the etiological factors is retained of this impaction and severe displacement is retained deciduous teeth. Other problems with the retained deciduous teeth is localized crowding, like this case here. The patient has congenitally missing premolar and the E has stayed longer than uh, expected. So 
Now, if you can compare the mesodistal width of this E and the mesodistal width of the second premolar, you can find that this is much uh, wider than the permanent successor. And so we ended up having localized crowding more on the right. Other clinical cases that could be uh, associated with retained deciduous teeth, like here, for example, is a palatally displaced central incisor with anterior crossbite. It could be related to retained A. Uh, and here we have uh, retained uh, C that caused this canine to erupt palatally and we ended up having crossbite. So these are local problems related to local factors, and for these cases, it is retained deciduous teeth. Now we're going to come to the problems related in tooth form. Now, variation tooth form, uh, and that is size or shape, can result from disturbances during the stage of morphodifferentiation. Um, Sometimes some uh, carryover from the histodifferentiation stage could contribute to this problem. Uh, examples of variation tooth form could be macrodontia, big teeth, microdontia, small teeth, gemination, fusion is what we call double teeth, and we talked about this in the first lecture, as well as dilaceration, concrescence, and taurodontism. So again, most commonly, uh, the macrodontia usually affects the incisors, the, the, uh, the maxillary central incisors, and uh, these both central incisors are affected by macrodontia. This lateral incisors is bigger than the average, like, like the contralateral, for example, and uh, this is what we call macrodontia. So what are the consequences of having a bigger tooth than the average? Well, usually we have crowding, displacement of the adjacent teeth, and rotation, as you can see here. So if we look at this, for example, and we say, okay, what's the etiology of crowding? Now, part of it is general, like what we say, tooth size archling discrepancy. But because this problem is localized, so we need to find a local problem. And here, we, would, we have to say that the problem is uh, the... Uh, macrodontia affecting the upper right lateral incisor. In terms of microdontia, and this is the opposite, smaller teeth than the average, and the most commonly affected teeth are usually the maxillary lateral incisors, followed by the uh, mandibular second premolars. So what happens if we have microdontia affecting few teeth or all teeth? Well, we will end up having spacing. In terms of the lateral incisors, if the lateral incisors are small, then according to the guidance theory, that is, the erupting canine is usually guided by the distal surface of the root of the lateral incisors. So if the lateral incisors is abnormal in terms of shape or size, or in terms of being congenitally missing, then the upper, the erupting maxillary canine will lose its guidance and it will have a higher risk of impaction. This is what we call guidance theory. So patients with microdontia affecting the lateral incisor can have a higher risk of impaction of the maxillary canine. Other consequences of having microdontia, rotation of adjacent teeth as well. Like you can see here, small teeth spacing multiple rotations. Gemination and fusion, we talked about how uh, we talked about uh, being able to differentiate between these two. And uh, uh, as you can see, this is uh, an example of uh, gemination. This is an example of fusion. If you look at this case here, you'll find that this is the left canine, this is the right canine. And if you count one, two, three, four, you will have four incisors, but the uh, Lower right central is actually uh, trying to uh, split into two, and this is uh, what we call gemination. So the consequences are usually the uh, just you know abnormally uh, big tooth that needs reshaping, sometimes uh, extraction if it's really severe, uh, rotation of adjacent teeth, the crowding. 
sine laceration is the presence of an angle between uh, the uh, crown and the root or within the root itself and usually it is it, it, it could be idiopathic uh, we don't know the etiology uh, or it could be uh, related to trauma uh, so uh, another definition is distortion or bend in the root uh, and mainly the teeth that are affected are the upper centrals or lateral incisors. As we said, it could be developmental, we don't know the etiology, maybe it's during development, but also it is. it could be due to trauma. Uh, it could be uh, clinically presented as a normal eruption, so you can actually identify this problem uh, by accident, by having radiographs, so it doesn't show any signs or symptoms. Uh, but if it is more severe, then we can have delayed eruption or sometimes even impaction. So these are examples of having dilaceration, which is a bend or angle within the root itself, or as we said, between the crown and the root. Concrescence, which is fusion between uh, two adjacent teeth at the level of the cement. And uh, usually it is expressed clinically as failure of eruption and uh, it is uh, identified by uh, radiographic assessment and the best is the Columbian CT scan. Pterodontism, which is a wide trunk of teeth, um, really in terms of malocclusion, it doesn't uh, affect that much uh, the resulting features, but if you're going to go for, for example, extraction, then we will prefer to extract such a tooth with this anomaly. Um, uh, root canal treat treatment is going to be more difficult, and we need to take this into consideration if extraction is necessary in, in, in the, uh, during orthodontic treatment. Uh, the uh, dense invaginatus and dense evaginatus again are abnormalities in the form and is the, the invaginatus has the uh, increased risk of uh, uh, root problems, uh, indoor problems and uh, if not properly identified and treated uh, then we will end up with a tooth that lost its um, vitality and we end up needing into treatment during orthodontic uh, the course of orthodontic treatment. A uh, patient with dense evaginitis, usually if it is severe enough, it might affect the occlusion, it might affect the overbite, and it might cause displacement of the tooth. And uh, considering this during uh, orthodontic planning is important uh, to achieve a proper uh, occlusion. Now, in terms of the abnormalities in tooth position and eruption, uh, we will start with the submerged teeth or the infraocluded teeth. And uh, this happens when a tooth fails to uh, erupt to its normal vertical uh, level uh, up to the occlusal plane. And usually, this is uh, the epidemiology is 1 to 9 percent of the population. Uh, we can call it submerged, and sometimes we can call it an ankylosed tooth. Uh, but not every ankylosed tooth is submerged, and not every submerged tooth is ankylosed, so we need to be careful during diagnosis. Uh, males and females are affected equally. Primary dentition is 10 times more affected than the permanent dentition, and uh, usually develops uh, an early mixed dentition. And most teeth that are affected are the second primary molars. More commonly affecting Caucasians and Hispanic ethnic groups. And the etiology is really unknown, but there is a strong genetic components involved in the etiology. This feature or this anomaly uh, of, the, uh, of the malocclusion could be really uh, related uh, to other uh, features and problems, so we can you know, these problems can come as a package with other dental anomalies, for example, uh, ectopic eruption of permanent molars, or palatal displacement of maxillary canines, or congenital absence of premolars. Uh, so these anomalies 
together with a submerged E could actually come together. It's common for them to come together. So if you have one of these anomalies, then it's important and logical to look for the uh, for other for other anomalies in the same patient. Clinically, it's important to go for checking the mobility of the um, second primary molars, and you need to classify the severity of the submerged tooth. Uh, mild is above the contact point, uh, moderate around the contact point, severe below the contact point, and, uh, and accordingly this will affect the uh, diagnosis and treatment planning. If the uh, primary uh, second molar is ankylosed, then you go with the back of your mirror, you tuck on it, and you should hear a think count sound that tells you that this tooth actually the root is fused with the bone, ankylosed. Uh, another feature of the submerged teeth is to look for the opposing uh, tooth, and usually if it's in the maxilla, then you will, you will find over eruption of the opposing teeth in the maxilla. Also, the other thing that you need to check for is the presence of the permanent successor, and usually if it's an E, then you look for the uh, second premolar. And then you can take a radiograph to check for other features associated. So what is the consequences in terms of malocclusion? If you have a submerged tooth, why is this considered a local factor in terms of the etiology of malocclusion? Well, a submerged tooth has consequences if untreated. We will have delayed exfoliation of the primary tooth and delayed eruption of the permanent successor if present, if it progresses, uh, it might go under the gingiva and this will requ require more severe uh, procedure for extraction and more extension of uh, bone loss during this procedure. Tipping of the surrounded teeth, like here for example, the sixth tipped mesily due to submerged E. You can have over eruption of the uh, opposing teeth, as we said, uh, damage to adjacent teeth because you will have nice uh, area of uh, food retention, caries, pocketing, problems, reduced alveolar bone level. As the tooth submerge, it will actually uh, pull the bone with it downward. And as we said, more submerging means more extensive extraction, and that will lead to loss of bone. So you will have reduced alveolar bone support associated with ankylosis. Uh, this is an example of a patient who presented to our clinic. And as you can see here, the problem is in the upper left quadrant. So we have the canine permanent, canine permanent first, uh, premolar. And actually, this area here are remains of the sub merged uh, primary second molar and underneath it is the permanent second premolar. Because of the delayed diagnosis of this case, it is so severe that both uh, first molar and first premolar actually tipped toward the space. So we, we have lack of space and crowding and the uh, submerge is so severe that it, it caused um, uh, poor development of the alveolar bone uh, because it sinks uh, upward and it uh, it pulls the bone with it all the way up or, or to be to be more accurate actually all teeth developed vertically except for this area this is a more accurate description of this clinical case uh, and we have, of course, delayed eruption and exfoliation, uh, eruption of the permanent teeth and exfoliation of the primary teeth. And this is another box from uh, orthodontics at a glance. You can capture this image and it tells you about the uh, infra occlusion of the deciduous uh, molar, uh, the presence of permanent successor and developing occlusion, what happens to the developing occlusion, and the consequences. Uh, of these problems. Right, now we come to another problem related to eruption and that is failure or delayed eruption. Uh, if you diagnose it, then you need to look and check patient's dental development and that is the dental age. 
and give a period of observation accordingly. Uh, further investigation in terms of radiographs, etc., is needed only if that sequence of eruption has disturbed. Let's see this case here, for example. The four permanent lower incisors erupted, and the permanent lateral incisors bilaterally erupted, but the central incisors hasn't erupted yet. So this is a clear disturbance of sequence of eruption. Then we need to look for radiographs, take a proper history, proper examination, etc. The other uh, clinical scenario where we need further investigation, we need to worry, is when we have asymmetric eruption. So we have, for example, eruption of one side fully, we wait six months, and then the other side didn't erupt, then we need to carry out further investigation. The teeth most commonly associated with abnormal eruption are usually the maxillary canine, the central incisors, and the first molars. These are systemic conditions associated with the elite tooth eruption and local factors causing disturbances of tooth eruption. We can look at these tables uh, by capturing image of this slide. So let's talk about the terminology of impaction. Impaction, sometimes if you read textbooks and some articles, they call it embedded eruption, or sometimes they call it ectopic eruption. And this is one of the most commonly prevalent dental anomaly in any population. Uh, an impacted tooth is a tooth that has failed to erupt at the right time in the right position, taking into consideration patient's dental development and the presence of any physical obstacle in the way of eruption. Now, prevalence of impact of impacted teeth may range from 5 to 19 percent, and it depends on which population we're talking about, which ethnic group, the group we have studied, age group, and lots of other factors. We carried out a study to look at the prevalence of, of impaction in the Jordanian population, and we found that it's, a, it's about uh, a little bit less than 7 percent. So it's about 7 percent of the Jordanian population suffer impaction of one of the teeth. So the study showed that most commonly we have impaction of the maxillary canine followed by impaction of the mandibular second premolar and then the maxillary second premolar and then the mandibular canine. These are the four most common teeth affected by uh, impaction. And in terms of investigation and diagnosis, it's important during the clinical examination to go for uh, palpation of any presence of bulge. Like here, for example, if you're careful and you go for palpation, you will find that you have buccal bulge. And this indicates that the canine is present and it is buccally displaced. You need to check the inclination of adjacent teeth, like here, for example, the lateral incisors are tilted distally, and this means that the erupting canine are actually pushing against the uh, roots of the lateral incisors. And this is the reason why these lateral incisors are tipped distally. Um, also, we need to look for the color of the adjacent teeth, and this might indicate uh, loss of vitality if you have darkening of the tooth. Uh, that means we have root resorption and need further investigation. So you go for also mobility of any retained tooth or even the adjacent teeth, you need to check for mobility. Uh, and after that, you can go for further investigation using radiographs. Uh, usually we look for an RPG, which gives you a general assessment uh, and screening of the whole dentition. And here we need to look into any radiograph that we take into the presence of teeth, it's position to go for the uh, assessing and classifying the, the proper prognosis. So we need to identify the prognosis and any associated pathology. So here, for example, we have an impacted canine. We don't have retained C, uh, almost total loss of the space of the canine. And you can see that the lateral incisor that is fully erupted is tilting uh, this study and this express the uh, possible position of this canine. We could
important also to, uh, to determine exactly the position of the canine. Is it buccally displaced or within the line of the arch or palatally displaced? In addition to the clinical examinations and palpation and looking for the adjacent teeth, we can use the vertical or horizontal parallax technique to localize the tooth uh, more accurately. So we can take a baroclusal lateral radiograph. So this one is, sh is showing you the canine is actually palatally impacted, or we can take a proper complete CT scan. So an impacted tooth, how does that affect the malocclusion? How is this a local factor uh, uh, resulting in a specific features of the malocclusion? So if you have an impacted tooth, this could be associated with pathology, caries and pain, and sometimes resorption of adjacent teeth. We will also have malalignment of adjacent teeth, like the cases we, we showed you before, like the lateral incisors being tipped. Sometimes we get ankylosis, uh, retained deciduous teeth. It might also compromise function and aesthetic. So if we look at specific impaction of a specific teeth, like the first permanent molars, this problem actually occurs 2 to 6% of children, and this is a relatively high percentage. Luckily, most of these patients go unnoticed, this problem unnoticed, it will resolve uh, by itself, but some will actually get worse. The consequences of having an impacted first permanent molars could be caries of adjacent teeth or of this tooth in specific because it's more difficult to clean, pain, pulpitis, uh, abscess formation. Sometimes this will lead premature loss of E. So sometimes if it is extrapically erupted, it will cause resorption of the adjacent teeth. Uh, and usually at early age, this is the E. We can lose it. And if we lose it, then this means that we will have loss of space and potential impaction of the second premolar. So this is an example of ectopic eruption of permanent teeth. Uh, this is going from mild A, B, C, D to very severe ectopic eruption or impaction of the first permanent molars. Mild usually goes with maybe caries, uh, pocketing, uh, pain, and then we have more severe resorption, uh, loss of the E, and this, as, as we said, possible impaction of the five. This is a radiograph showing you severe ectopic eruption of the first uh, permanent molars. And this is actually usually associated with uh, loss of the E and impaction of the five if not uh, treated properly. Unerupted maxillary incisor is, the most uh, uh, is one of the teeth that are affected, commonly affected. And the most common cause is um, is usually a parallel shaped tuberculate supernumerary, as we said. It doesn't erupt this supernumerary, but it will affect the eruption of permanent teeth and cause impaction. Trauma is another etiological factor, uh, usually trauma to the uh, deciduous teeth that will lead to uh, displacement of the follicle of the developing incisor, dilaceration, and eventually delayed eruption or even impaction. Impacted maxillary canine, uh, on the other hand, is more common. The canine should start to bulge buccally between the age of 8 to 10. So during the uh, you know, normal examination of patients who come for review every six months within the, the next dentition, you need part of the examination, you need to add palpation of the bulging of the canine in the, in the buccal sulcus. And it should be there between the age of 8 to 10. If you fail to palpate it, or if you can palpate it on one side but not the other, then definitely further investigation is necessary. So this is an example of a patient with a canine on the right side with normal eruption, path of eruption, and the one on the left side, usually you will not be able to palpate it because this one is palatally displaced and it started to migrate uh, all through the root of the lateral incisors and it, uh, it is reaching the central incisor. So an early detection of this problem is important for a proper treatment. 
Transposition is another problem that contributes this to the uh, features of malocclusion. As we said, it is switching of places between two adjacent teeth. So this is the three canine, and this is the first premolar, and this is the retained teeth. This contributes to crowding, retained deciduous teeth, possible pathologies, and root resorption if not treated properly. Now we're going to come to local abnormalities of soft tissues that could contribute to problems within the dentition. And here local abnormalities of soft tissue, an example is low, lower frenal attachment. Uh, the upper frenal, if it's abnormal, we call it low upper frenal attachment. And it will have an insertion of fibrous tissues in between the central incisors and we will end up having median diastema. And although after eruption of the permanent uh, canine, usually these diastemas close, but for patients with low upper frenal attachment, it will persist. So this is one of the soft tissues that can contribute to the uh, cause of diastemas. And to be able to diagnose this properly, we have two things to do. The first thing is the planching test. So you have to pull uh, this frenal attachment upward with the upper lip and if it shows you white planching of the gingiva in between the central incisors that means the insertion is right there in between them. The other thing we could do is to take a periapical and usually we end up having a v-notch shape within the bone and this also confirms the diagnosis that this uh, phenol attachment fibrous tissues are actually inserted in here between the central incisors. So if we ask about the etiology of a diastema, then you need to check for phenol attachment. Other pathologies and problems could be cysts or tumors, and these might prevent eruption, causing displacement of teeth, causing impaction. Um, uh, an example is the uh, eruption cyst and um, usually it overlies the crown of erupting tooth and it is filled with blood or fluids and we just need to sometimes spontaneously it can resolve so we just need to observe but if it persists then we need to go for marsupialization and uh, removal of the cyst to avoid impaction of the permanent successor. Other local pathology that might contribute to uh, developing of malocclusion is chronic periodontitis. So if you have periodontal problems that persist for a long time, we will lose bone support, we will lose soft tissue support, and we will start to have drifting of teeth all around the arch. For example, incisors can drift labially, they can procline, and they will cause spacing. And usually you will have patients uh, who will come to your clinic and say, we never had these spaces between our teeth. It just developed within the last few uh, years. And you will know that the, this patient has lost uh, periodontal support for his teeth and they ended up migrating, uh, usually measly and, and uh, labially, causing this, these features of malocclusion. So these are the main classifications of local factors. So these two lectures have covered uh, all uh, topics related to local factors. Uh, this is Dr. Marim Abdullah, and thank you for listening.